Hi, this is Pastor Darren at Amazing Grace Community Church. Welcome to another exciting uh, study in the Word of God. You know, the scriptures are full of some very interesting love stories. For example, Abraham marries his half-sister. Hmm. Jacob marries two sisters, and the first one he marries before he even knows about it. Job's wife tells him to curse God and die. Samson's lovers turn on him, have him arrested. Hosea is told to marry a prostitute. Ezekiel, his wife dies and he's told not to grieve. David kills his lover's husband so that he could have her. And the woman at the well had five husbands, and she was currently living with a sixth man, not her husband. You know, not even Hollywood uh, would be able to, to make up stuff like that. And yet, all of those love stories were true. Well, today, I want to look at another love story that has a happy ending. In fact, I believe that this love story really leads to the greatest love story of all time. I hope that you have your Bibles with me. Would you turn to the book of Ruth? The book of Ruth, it's, it's after the book of Judges, shortly before the book of Psalms. A beautiful story. Ruth is a beautiful love story that's set in the midst of a very ugly period in history kind of like what our nation is experiencing right now. In fact, the end of Judges describes the time. In Judges 21 and 25, it says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. In other words, there was relative chaos and anarchy. Again, kind of like what we're seeing today. See, what happened was Israel was on this horrible merry-go-round ride of destruction. They would fall away from God. They would be punished. They would come back to God and fall away again. This terrible, vicious cycle. And yet in the midst of this vicious cycle, we discover a glimmer of hope in the person of Ruth. And boy, could we use some hope today. So would you... Pray with me, please, and let's dig into God's word together. Father, we do need hope. We do need a, a good ending to, to this story. We need to hear from you. And so I pray that your spirit would do what only you can do, that you would reach into every heart today and that you would speak your truth and that you would challenge us to respond in a way that honors you. Father, once again, would you speak for your children are listening? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Ruth means compassionate friend. I love that. Compassionate friend. And if anyone ever lived up to that name, it was Ruth. I want to take a look, first of all, at love demonstrated. In the first two chapters of Ruth, we're looking at love demonstrated. And chapter one really is about Ruth's love for Naomi. Ruth's love for Naomi. Now, again, God had warned Israel again and again that if they obeyed him, he would bless them. But if they disobeyed, he would punish them. There would be trouble. There would be hardship. There would be famine. Well, guess what's happening in the beginning of the book of Ruth? Follow along with me. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land because Israel was rebelling against God. And a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now, you need to understand this is not what God intended for them. See, instead of repenting of their sins in Israel, they chose to run away. 
Okay, they moved from the promised land to a pagan land full of idolatry. And it was a decision that would cost them dearly. In fact, Moab had been a longtime enemy of Israel. So they leave their promised land, they leave their homeland to go live in the land of their enemies. And it says in verse two, the man's name was Elimelech and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. And they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. This wasn't just a little vacation till things settled down or improved. They settled down in Moab. And verse 3 says, Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. And I can't help but wonder if his death was partly because of God's judgment against them for leaving their homeland. And verse 4 says, The sons married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. Did you catch that? They married foreign women. And that was against God's law. God had told them in Deuteronomy 7, verse 4, or verse 3, he says, Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Intermarrying with these pagan foreign women would cost Israel dearly in the years to come. See, instead of repenting and turning back to the Lord, they're becoming more and more pagan. The two sons marry Moabite women. And it goes on to say after they had lived there for about 10 years, both Malon and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. And I have to wonder again if this was part of God's judgment on them. But regardless, they were in a very desperate situation. You see, women in those days were very dependent upon their husbands. They couldn't just go out and and get a job and earn a living. There was no government help, no subsidies. These women were now in trouble. There was no one to take care of them. And so Naomi came up with a plan. It says in verse 6, When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, because apparently Israel had repented and returned to the Lord, it says Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. And with her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. And what happens next is remarkable. Verse 8, Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. And may the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. And may the Lord Yahweh grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. See, even in her great loss, Naomi still recognizes the goodness of the Lord. And yet, as we're going to see, she also blames the Lord for all her problems. Well, her daughters-in-law want to stay with her. They want to join with her. But look at what she says in verse 13. She says, no, my daughters, it's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. Well, could it be because you left the Lord when you left the promised land? And verse 14, at this, they wept again. And then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. Now, let me say that this is generally not a very effective means of evangelism. Go back to your gods. 
No. <clears throat> but what Ruth says next is beautiful. Look at what she says in verse 16. Ruth replied, no, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. And may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Powerful, powerful statement. What a powerful love that Ruth had for Naomi, her mother-in-law. She shows more love for her than she does her own mother at this point. In fact, Ruth demonstrates more faith than Naomi did. She's all in. She is committed till death do her part. See, somehow, somehow in all of Naomi's anguish and bitterness, her testimony of the Lord, Yahweh, was strong enough to convince Ruth to leave her family, leave her nation, her land, her gods, and claim Yahweh as her one true God. That's a powerful testimony. Ruth turns from her pagan gods, her pagan past, to follow the Lord. It's a perfect picture of repentance. It makes me wonder what we would be willing to give up to follow the Lord. And so Ruth and Naomi return to Bethlehem. But look at Naomi's perspective. Look how her attitude changes. She says in verse 20 of chapter 1, she says, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. She told them, call me Mara. Call me bitter. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. You know, how often do we hear that? How often have we maybe, maybe said that? It's all God's fault. He did this to me. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Our sin does this to us. It's our fault that we're in the mess we're in. In fact, we're seeing all around us today what happens to a world that rejects the Lord Yahweh. So in chapter one, we see Ruth's love for Naomi. In chapter two, I wanna take a look at Boaz's love for Ruth. Boaz's love for Ruth. See, they're back home in Israel now but that doesn't mean that everything is well and good. In fact, they still need to eat and survive. And so Ruth goes out to glean grain in the fields and she just so happens to end up in Boaz's field. Just a coincidence. Now, Boaz is a near relative of Elimelech. And thus, according to Jewish law, he is a potential surrogate husband for Ruth. Can you begin to see how the plot thickens here and the story begins to unfold? This is better than a Hallmark movie, isn't it? In verse 8 of chapter 2, Boaz says to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field. Don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls and watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. See, apparently uh, Ruth, remember, is a foreigner. Uh, she's a foreigner working in the fields with all sorts of men around. And as a result, she is vulnerable. It wasn't uncommon for women in those days in her position to be abused. And yet Boaz shows her much grace. 
you might say that Ruth is now reaping what she sowed in a good way. She trusted the Lord to take care of her, and that's what he's doing. In fact, look at verse 10 of chapter 2. Verse 10, uh, Ruth exclaimed, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? And Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland, and you came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord, may Yahweh repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have now come to take refuge. Now, let me share a little translation here, a vital translation to this story. The word for wings here is also the word for garment. Now, hold that thought. Ruth has come under the wings of the Lord. She's come under his protection, if you will. And so long story short, Ruth stays in Boaz's field. She reaps quite a harvest and she takes it home to Naomi. And when Naomi sees the harvest, she realizes that she's been in Boaz's field. Naomi's mother-in-law matchmaking instinct kicks in. And she says in verse 20 of chapter 2, The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. And she added, that man is our close relative. He's one of our kinsmen redeemers. And that word, that kinsman redeemer, is really the theme of this whole book. It's mentioned 13 times in these four chapters. The, the word literally means one like us who rescues us. One like us who rescue, rescues us. You see, the law in that day said that if a person died, his nearest relative was to, take, was to step in and take over the inheritance. And that meant that the the other relative was to come in and bear up children, raise up children in the deceased person's name. See, a kinsman redeemer could rescue them from poverty, could, could continue that legacy that had been left behind. It was vitally important in those days. God, in the law, had already provided a way for people in need to be rescued, to be redeemed. Hold that thought. Now, the plot thickens then as this incredible love story continues. We looked at the first two chapters of Love Demonstrated. The second two chapters, chapters three and four, I want to take a look at Love Rewarded. Love Rewarded. And in chapter three, we see that Ruth courts Boaz. Ruth courts Boaz. It's been said that it only takes two to make a marriage, a willing girl and an eager mother-in-law. This chapter is a perfect example of that. So Naomi then comes up with this secret, weird kind of plan to get Boaz's attention because apparently Boaz hasn't picked up yet on what's going on. And so Naomi says to Ruth in chapter three, verse four, at nighttime, when, when he lies down, note the place where he's lying and then go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. Uncover his feet and lie down. I know that sounds odd, but that's actually what was done in those days. There, there is a symbolism to it. This is nothing immoral, but it is very personal to uncover someone's feet. So Ruth obeys her mother-in-law. She goes at nighttime, sneaks in, 
to the threshing floor where Boaz is, and she lies down at his feet. She uncovers his feet. And it says in verse 8 of chapter 3, in the middle of the night, something startled the man, I would think so, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. And she said, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me, the one I just uncovered. Spread that corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. So what do you know? Ruth proposes to Boaz. That's what happened here. Did you catch the symbolism, though? Spread the corner of your garment that I just uncovered over me. And you remember another word for garment. It was wings. We saw that back in chapter 2. Wings of protection. You see, Ruth asked Boaz to do what Yahweh had already done, to cover her with his protection, to rescue her. That's what a kinsman redeemer does. He rescues and redeems those. He protects them. And Boaz graciously agrees to redeem her, and the next morning heads right off to the chapel. Well, actually, it was the city gate where all the legal matters took place. And then we come to chapter 4, where we see that Boaz marries Ruth. Boaz marries Ruth. Now, there's a little legal matter that needs to be taken care of first, because Apparently, there's a closer relative that should step up and take care of this. But that closer relative declines. He doesn't want to mess up his own family. And so uh, Boaz legally uh, takes care of this marriage. He legally marries Ruth. Look at verse 9 of chapter 4. It says, Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. And then notice how the elders respond, how they bless Boaz and Ruth. Verse 11, then the elders and all those at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord Yahweh make the woman who is coming into your house, you're like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. They were really the matriarchs of Israel, right? May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Now, Tamar was also a redeemed widow. Perez was her son, and Perez also was Boaz's ancestor. And boy, did this blessing come true. Because Boaz and Ruth later had a son named Obed. And Obed would become the grandfather of King David, who would eventually be an ancestor of King Jesus. And so once again, we have a pagan woman becoming an ancestor to Christ Jesus. How's that for the perfect love story? An incredible uh, thing that God orchestrates and puts together. A beautiful, beautiful love story. Now, there's more to this than just a nice love story with a happy ending. Because I want to point out two lessons that we need to learn from this. Two lessons that we can learn. Here's the first one. God blesses all who take refuge in him. He blesses all who take refuge in him. Even Ruth, this pagan Moabite, 
an outsider, a foreigner. And yet she came under the protection, under the wings of the Lord. She told Naomi in chapter one, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Boaz told her in chapter two, he says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Wow. Because of Ruth's faith in the Lord, she was blessed to come under his protection, under his security. She was blessed even more than that to come under Boaz's physical protection. And you might wonder, why was Boaz so gracious to Ruth? Why did he go out of his way to help Ruth? Because you see, Boaz knew what it was like to be an outsider. You may recall that one of Boaz's ancestors was Rahab. Rahab, the prostitute, was Boaz's ancestor. Boy, does God love irony or what? He takes Rahab and Ruth and their descendants and he brings them together in part of his perfect plan. God has a special place for outsiders, just like us, just like us. God blesses all those who come to take refuge in him. And he does that, secondly, through a kinsman redeemer. He does it through a kinsman redeemer. Now, think about this. Boaz rescued and redeemed Ruth. He, he, he saved them from becoming barren and broke. Not only that, but their grandson, David, rescued and redeemed the nation of Israel from all of their enemies around them. And what's more, David's descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ, has rescued and redeemed the whole world from sin and death. Now, Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, they had no idea at the time what God was doing. But God had a plan. They were a key part of God's sovereign plan to reconcile us and bring us back to himself. It's a beautiful story. You see, because of our sin, we are spiritually dead. We are destitute. We are deplorable, if you will. We are completely separated from a holy God and unable to rescue ourselves. We cannot redeem ourselves. There's nothing we can do. And so, like Israel and like Ruth, we need a kinsman redeemer. We need someone like us who can come and rescue us, who can reconcile us to God. And guess what? Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer. He was like us so that he could rescue us. The book of Ruth is this beautiful love story of how God redeems his children. You see, Jesus' wings, his garment of protection, is being offered to all who would come to him for refuge, all who come to him to be saved, if you will, even outsiders. Jesus can rescue us. He can redeem us because he paid the price of redemption. He paid for it with his own blood. Jesus knew that we were helpless. He knew we were destitute. He knew we could not save ourselves. And so, do you remember what John 3.16 says? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ came to be our kinsman redeemer. He loves us enough to come and redeem us at the cost of his own life. 
It's the greatest love story ever told. Amen? Greatest love story ever. But is it your story? Is this your story? Have you come under his wings? Have you been redeemed from your sinful situation? Have you been rescued by Jesus? Because, listen, it doesn't just happen, folks. We don't get automatically redeemed just because. It takes two to make this work. It takes a willing refugee, if you will, and a loving redeemer. We need to come to him as he comes to us. Jesus has done his part. He's paid the price to redeem us and bring us back. And now it's our turn. It's our turn to come to him. It's our turn to say, you are my God. It's our turn to beg him to rescue us and, and spread his garment over us. Because Jesus can't rescue us unless we ask him to, unless we recognize we need rescuing. And so I believe the real point to this beautiful love story, the bottom line is this, Jesus loves us to death. He loves us to death. Do we love him as much? Do you love Jesus? Have you found him to be your all in all, your protector, your provider, your savior? Do you love him with all your heart? Are you as committed to Christ as Ruth was to Naomi and Boaz and the Lord? Are you that committed? Has Jesus spread his covering over you? Have you given your heart and soul to trust and follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Think about that. Let's pray. Father, we can never thank you enough for your incredible love for us. We can never thank you for, for being such an awesome, incredible God that you would sacrifice your own son for the likes of us. We know that, that you are more than ready. You are eager to spread your wings over us, to spread your garment over us. And I'm so grateful, Lord, for that protection, for rescuing the likes of us. Father, I want to pray for those who may be watching this right now. And maybe they have never yet come to that point where they, they sense that they needed to be rescued. Maybe they've never come to that point where they realize that they are desperately separated from you and they need you to reconcile them. Lord, if there's anyone listening to this that has not yet been redeemed, I pray that they would cry out right now in their hearts. That they would say, God, have mercy on me. I'm deplorable. I'm, I'm desperate. I'm destitute. I can't do this. I need your protection. I need your sustenance. I need your salvation. I need you, Jesus. Please save me. Please take me under your wings. God, I pray that in this world of chaos and disorder, that we would find hope in our Savior, in our Redeemer. I pray that we would learn to love you more and more with all our heart, that we would understand what it means to be loved by you. And I pray that we would be bold in declaring to the world our great love, our first love, the Lord Jesus Christ. You're the hope and the answer to all of our problems. May we seek you with all our heart, for Jesus' sake and your glory. Amen. Amen. If today was the day you gave your heart to Jesus, if, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to message me, uh, email me, let me know. We would love to celebrate with you. We're so glad that you have, have been with us today. 
And we pray that God would give you a great, great week as you go forth and change your world. Be blessed.